Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, joining us today. She is a two-time Olympian in Rio and Tokyo for the Olympic refugee team. She is from Syria and the subject of the number one movie on Netflix right now titled The Swimmers. And she is this fall starting at USC as a film and TV production major. Today, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Yusra Mardini. Yusra, how are you? Hi, good. Thanks for having me. for being here. I'm really excited to talk about your swimming journey, which is quite unique to most other athletes and most other humans in the world. Um, As I mentioned earlier, The Swimmers is now out on Netflix, is the number one movie in the world on Netflix right now. Um, Just to start there, how has the reaction been um, since the movie came out? What, what, What is it? How have people reacted to you in person and uh, on the internet? Um, to be honest, it's incredible. I did not like expect, I obviously knew that lots of people are excited to see the movie and lots of people want to know the story in detail and what happened because there was interest, of course, after the Rio Olympics. And again, in Tokyo, the story got famous again. So, um, I've been waiting for the movie to go out since five years now. So I was like, I'm not going to believe there's a movie until I see it. And when I saw it, it was really so heartwarming just to see everything that I went through and then where I am today and it made me it makes me just really happy that everyone's watching and relating you can relate to so so many things in the movie if you don't relate to being the swimmer you relate to um, being a sibling you relate to being a coach you relate to being someone that just is helping refugees so in general it's just you know I, I am very very happy that people are opening up to it and just uh suggesting to everyone to watch it and and to see that what a refugee is as well it's something very important um i myself just watched it last night i I was really touched by it it was a very moving film from honestly from start to finish yeah absolutely uh what was your involvement in the film if if at all um yeah so in the beginning we got in touch with um the script writer with the producers and then the director came on board a you know a, a while later um we told the story to jack thorne which is an amazing script writer he did a, a lot of amazing movies um and after that we met the director they came to where we were living in berlin because we lived at the swimming clubhouse actually for a while after they took us in you can see in the movie and uh, they came and uh They figured, like, they they saw the area, they talked to us. Whenever they had questions, we answered them. Uh, They had also um, another filmmaker that was from Syria that advised them a lot on set as well. So to be honest, it 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 was really nice because we felt very involved. And whenever they had any questions, we were there. And I was on set and I was in the movie. I doubled myself in this in the endless pool scenes. (laughs) <laughs> it's so funny that you bring that up <laughs> that was awkward because like they were like on set they were like you surround number two and i was like no no i'm the, like i'm the original one you could not tell me that but yeah no i did the butterfly scenes and the um, you know you see that when i'm i'm pre- pre- getting like preparing for the olympics the changing of caps and swimming butterfly that was actually me so that's so Awesome and so funny because I watched it with my friend and during those scenes, my you friend was like, "You can see, right?" <laughs> well, you can kind of tell, but yeah. like I, I my so my friend was like, "Oh wow, the actress like s- caught on to <laughs> swimming really well," and I was like, "No, that ha- there, it's probably a stunt double." But yeah. I had no, I didn't yeah. think you would be the stunt double. Yeah, the the two uh, the two actresses they did not know how to swim before the movie. They learned, um, the actress that played me, Natalie, uh, learned how to swim butterfly in two months. Can you imagine? And in the wow. end, in the scene of the Olympics, she swam 25 meters butterfly. And that was like, when you see her sister crying in the scene, she was really crying. 
because she was <laughs> like, oh my God, that's such an achievement. Um, and in general, it was just fun. There are also double, like girls that doubled um, for Natalie as well, uh, that were, you know, professional swimmers as well. So it's, you know, all of it. Um, lots of swimmers were definitely involved. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Did, was yeah. it true that Sven, your coach, also coached them? Yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, for the most part, it was a coach named Adele, and she was uh, at the London pool where they filmed the Rio scene. Um, okay. It was at the London Olympic pool as well, by the way. <laughs> yes. Kind so of it's ironic. like everything, everything, every detail was thought of and everything you know, was made perfectly. Um, but yes, Sven did coach them. Uh, they were they were in Berlin when they were in Berlin. Uh, and uh, basically it was it was Sven and Adele, another coach that coached both girls. Yeah. Wow. So really just like a, a group effort as a whole. But yeah. So cool how involved you were. Um, so after watching the movie, after for you seeing the finished product, do you feel like like can you give a percentage of how accurate you think it was because i don't know i assume a lot of movies kind of take artistic yeah turns or you know w- yeah what was your take on it yeah I'll, honestly i was very scared in the beginning because i was like whoever is gonna play me is not me and they will never like be me so i was very scared but um i was on set the last set so i wasn't able to be on set the whole time because i was preparing for tokyo and you know before that all the athletes were in a bubble because we didn't want to get covid uh so i i didn't get to be on set at all and the last time i was on set it was that it was the last set, set they had so i was on it where i did the like uh, endless pool and i saw natalie she was doing something in the endless pool and then like the director was like okay fine it looks good now you can do it she was like no, I don't want to look like I'm doing it for the first time. I, I want to do it the right way. And then I was like, okay, I trust this girl in my life. I think she did an amazing job. And then when I watched the movie, it really, really uh, reminded me of myself. And to be honest, percentage, I would say 90%. Because even, but even if you think about it, the fictionalized um, scenes, they are so important. Like whenever I was asking the director, Sally, I was like, why is this scene there? And she explained it was because she said it from the from the beginning and I respected that so much. She was like, I am telling your story and Sarah's story, but that's not the main point. The main point is telling the story of millions of refugees around the world. And that is the main thing of the movie. And that's what I'm, I've been doing since five years. I've been bringing awareness about what's happening in the world. And I think the movie captured that in a, such a beautiful way. Um, but there was a little twist of finally the happy ending of me going to the Olympics. Um, and that is, you know, the 1% of, of what happens with refugees. And you can see from the other perspective, the, the cousin, how he got depressed, as example, or sad. He didn't feel like he fit in. And then you can see the other um, refugee from Eritrea that got pushed back to Eritrea. So I think it was even the fictionalized um, scenes, they were very, very important. And in general, I was just like when I watched the movie, crying, laughing, crying again with my sister. So we really, really loved it. I I have a couple specific questions about really just one scene. Um, you you finish the swim, right? You you cross the ocean in this raft yeah. with eighteen people that was meant for six or seven. Um, and like to me, one of two of the most powerful things in the movie was the first. Everyone's just so exhausted, so tired, yeah. and then someone starts. Someone stabs the raft, right? And then you yeah. all start just dismantling this raft, and you throw it back into the ocean. Yeah. Um, I'm just personally, I'm curious. Was there a moment like that where you? Well, it you was were real. Just... Yeah. Okay. It, it it was it was real. Um, and the reason we did that and we ripped the boat because people the the smugglers use it all the time. They take it again from Greece to Turkey to put more refugees on it, and our boat was used before we uh, we were on it that obviously wasn't new uh, it is expensive for them to buy you know a new dinghy every time they want refugees on it so the smugglers they would come to greece they will i don't know what they had how the deal worked but the motor would be sent back to turkey somehow and so was the dinghy and we were ripping it apart because like we really really didn't want anyone to use it anymore because it was sinking with us being on it and we didn't want for anyone else to be on it 
Um, I did not rip it at all, but um, it was my sister, definitely my sister, and uh, some other guys. Yeah, and so then quite so that's again to me that was just such a powerful scene and of uh, such a release of emotion, right, and a release of of feeling. And then you walk up on the beach, and you see thousands of life jackets from from other refugees yeah. um that you know that obviously ha- had taken a similar path um and i think that speaks I-, I thought that did a beautiful job at speaking to that bigger picture as you said sally wanted to speak to yeah um so in general um this was a fictionalized scene but my sister when she went back to greece and worked she had a picture with the whole life jackets and that as that picture got famous when my sister later on got arrested. Um, so um, Sally wanted to put it because it's a very, very famous area in Greece where all the life jackets were thrown there because you cannot get rid of the life jackets. You cannot burn them because it's very bad for the environment. So what's happening with the life jackets right now? Um, NGOs and organizations, nonprofit organizations are taking them and recycling them to um, bracelets uh, to, um, you know, phone covers, to laptop covers, to bags or whatever, just to keep a reminder that there are millions around the world that are still going through that. Um, and yeah, it's it's a really heartbreaking scene. Hard, yeah, it is heartbreaking scene because you, when you look at that, you see how many people crossed and you don't know if all of them made it or not. Lots of people lose their lives um, in the sea, of course, and um, it's just unfortunately the sad truth. And it was portrayed in the movie, and that was very, very important. Yeah, and and again, I yeah, it was just to me a, a really great job at portraying that message and a very powerful scene. Yeah. Once once you, um, your sister, the the other refugees you were with were off the boat. How long did it take you to get to Germany? Um, so in general, the whole trip took us 25 days. And I think we stayed in we stayed in, um, in Turkey for a week. So um, the rest took us like 15 or, or 20 days. Um, but in Turkey, it took us a while to leave because we had to find a smuggler. And we were very confused where to go who to go with. You had one group on Facebook that, you know, all the people from Syria or refugees were advising each other where to go, what to do, where, what not to do, what borders are okay. Um, so it took us a while to decide. Um, but uh, you can see in the movie, like if we were deciding between to go like by foot to the borders or swimming or, or in the boat. But um, in real life, it was boats because no one makes it by foot because it's you know the 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 guards and so on it's very very hard for anyone to cross um so we knew we were going by boat um but yeah it took us 25 days in general to to get to germany wow uh that's yeah that's a while uh, so then once you arrive in germany how long did it before you met with sven and you were able to start training for swimming again um that's a funny story because when I got to Germany I was I didn't have a pool but I was still doing like I was still doing aerobics and I was still doing I was still going to run and and doing all my exercises like my uh band exercises and so on and my sister was like what are you doing like we are sitting in a refugee camp right now I was like yeah well I have nothing to do so why not and I didn't know what it was I training for because I had no team. I had nothing basically. And uh, I even shared a bathroom with like, I don't know how many people. I lived in a tent uh, outside of the camp because the day we arrived, 12,000 other people arrived. So the capacity of Germany, just taking everyone in Berlin, as example, uh, where we arrived to take everyone to the buildings was very, very hot. So we stayed in a, in a tent. Me and my sister went to this amazing Egyptian translator and we were like, hey, we're professional swimmers. He was like, are you really? I was like, yeah, I swear, I was in the, I was in like, I was in the national team. It was like there are lots of people that told me that. And when we went to the, <laughs> to the clubs, to the swim, like to the sports club, they were not. I was like, please trust us, take us if you know anyone. And then he took us to this, um, to this swimming club, where basically the, 
the boss of Sven, uh, the, 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 the lady who owns the club said, yeah, they can come. And then she was like, hey, Sven, go see them. You know, that was how it is. And he was very annoyed in the beginning. And then when we were in the water, oh, and in this, in the, you can see it in this scene when we asked for swimsuits, that was real. I had no swimsuit. I was like, hey, can you test my swimming? And can you give me a suit maybe? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was real. Uh, maybe not the same confidence, but because we were very, very thankful um, that they took us in and so on. And then when we swam, he asked us who trained us or if we ever had camps like in Canada or the U.S., because of the technique. And I told him, oh, if you trained my, my dad, he was like analyzing Michael, Michael Phelps every day, every race, you know, uh, and technique was one of the most important things for my dad. And if I swam the time that he wanted me to swim, but the technique was not okay, he would make me repeat it until both were okay. So that's the type of coach he was. Um, and that's how I met Sven. And then we started, I told him about my dream of going to the Olympics. The goal was really Tokyo 2020. Um, and then we reached out. We saw that the ISC uh, president, Thomas Bach, um, he said about, you know, scholarship and the, about the refugee Olympic team. I applied for the scholarship. I got the scholarship. And then, um, crazy enough, the team was created. So that's how I met Sven. And I was very, until now, I, I think he was very shook by how positive we were and how positive we were when we told him the story, like he was crying and we were just like, you know, we were okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess if you live it, it's, it's different. I mean, like yeah. I, I was crying watching the movie. Right. And that's like two steps away from the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, just like looking, looking at, at your Instagram or you know, like looking at this story online, like, you know, I, I get, I get choked up cause it, it is, it's, yeah it's not everyone it's a really unique story and it, it, a lot you went through a lot it seems like you went through a lot um yeah so you mentioned your dad I, i'll i'm gonna get back to sven but you mentioned your dad so i i would love to hear about your upbringing in swimming and just how your dad influenced your swim career um i hated swimming in the beginning <laughs> i'm not gonna lie i was a child that really hated the cold water uh i started swimming um so my dad did not even put me in the pool in the beginning you know where the pool i don't know what you call it in english but this is the pool and then when the water goes out there's a small thing the the gutter exactly so basically he would take that off and he would make me move my kicks i was i was a baby literally he would make me do that and then after that um slowly i learned how to swim and he would put two, I have no clue what that's called neither. He would put like two floaties? Things, yeah, two floating stuff. Okay. And he uh -huh. would just put me in the water where, when the national team was training. And I would get, you know, <laughs> hit. I, no one cares about me. I was just in the pool trying to survive. How old were um, you when that happened? Yeah. Yeah, and then and then I tried to. I was very young. I was like five, four. Um, okay. and then, yeah, so it was the rough way. I mean, no, no wonder why I hated swimming. It was, um, but yeah, slowly I I I learned how to um, get away from people and like try to swim. And after that, he had time for me. Really, in the beginning, he was just like playing around. And then when he had time for me, I started training. Really, when I was I think five. Um, and after that, I started getting very competitive. I started being like better than older girls. Um, and then I really loved it. I loved just being better than everyone else. And, uh, he made me, well, I loved it too. It's why it wasn't just because of him, but in, I was a medley swimmer. I swam the, the hardest things. Basically he made me swim the two, two fly four medley, 800, 1,500. And all of them I had the records for in Syria. I have more than 25 uh, Syrian records. So it was it was nice to be honest. I'm not gonna lie. We have we had 50 meter pool as well where we train. In the summer we trained outside and also 50 meter pool. Um, but yeah, that's basically he was a tough one. And it's a, he's exactly as you see him in the movie. He wanted his three three daughters to be, you know, the Olympic, the next Olympic champions. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, give me, give me just a taste of like what a training session looked like or what a week looked like, you know, like how many times would you train in a normal week? 
Um, honestly, I would train. Every, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say I wouldn't train. I was training every day, cause mm. even and I was training even on the weekend. He was training us because we like comparing compared to like Europe and so on. We didn't have enough because I was training two hours every day, um, and like an hour dry land maybe extra every two days. But we didn't have the same systems. We I basically I basically would wake up at seven a.m. and I would go to school until two p.m. Then my dad would be waiting with the car outside to take us to the pool, and then after that, like we would train. We we're very young for like gym, so we didn't do gym at that point. Um, and yeah, after that, like slowly we started. So my dad on the weekends, whenever whenever we have anything, whenever we were anywhere. It's exactly like in the movie. Whenever anyone's birthday, he was speaking about swimming. My mom would get bored and go do something else. And we were just stuck with him. Like whenever there was world championships, European championships, Olympic games, you were sitting, learning about everything that we're doing. If there was a new turn, he would he had to teach it to us. Um, home, we were doing lots of band work and lots of other, other things. Um, I hated it, but now looking back, I'm like, he was really such a unique coach, but he didn't get like he didn't get the opportunity of other coaches. And I think like if we had the right circumstances, I have no doubt that I would have been a really, really good swimmer. Um, but yeah, in general, I'm very thankful for everything he did. And um, even if he's a little bit extreme, I now, now I understand why he was, because he wanted us to be different and like uh not ordinary or or you know to have the the technique that we had and to have um different styles of be but okay one point that was a bit extreme he wanted be he wanted me to be good in every stroke and everything and he was challenging everyone with that which is which was fun um but I was very young so I had to find a stroke at one point <laughs> Un- understandable uh <laughs> like you said earlier you know this this the film has something that everyone can relate to um obviously it's about the bond between you and your sister yeah. is is at the forefront i grew up swimming with my older brother who's 2 years older and so like right off the bat i was it's, like yes i get it the competition um, always <laughs> exactly yeah it's like i mean and you spend so much time in the pool as a swimmer yeah. you know it's like you, you, how it's a very bonding experience um yeah. how did you and your sister kind of coming up and swimming together having your dad as your coach can you describe the the bond that that built between you two um to be honest it was very it was too much to be honest because like we were doing everything together like everything and at one point like I was like okay we should have been twins because everything we're, we do everything together um so we went to school at the same school together and then he would pick us up we'd go to the pool um she was more way wild than I am and she was the one always refusing or questioning him at the pool or like what do you want from me? I don't want to do that. And he would always get furious. And I was like the kid that did everything not to make him angry, I guess. Um, Until a certain point, I realized a lot about life and a lot about swimming. Um, But yeah, no, I had, I had a really good relationship with, with my sister. And uh, I think there was a bit of competition that my dad created, not, not us. Um, and that created a little bit of, of distance, but in general, we've been always there for each other. And uh, both we loved swimming and obviously swimming gave us gave us so much, but I never really liked how he made us compete with each other. Like sometimes it was extreme. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I felt like it it irked me just, you know, again, watching it, it's like, oh, ah, yeah. don't do that. Right. It, it's yeah. just, yeah, it's not healthy and not healthy yeah. for siblings, but obviously you guys, this relationship prevailed. We learned a lot from it. Yeah. We learned yeah. a lot. Um, so then how old were the two of you when you set out to go to Germany? Um, I was 17 and my sister was 20. Okay. Um, yeah. And then when you actually made the the trip in the boat, did that you know afterwards did that affect your relationship with the water at all I mean I know it was a pretty 
It, it was only a few hours. Yeah. I'm sure it felt a lot longer, but yeah. Um, to be honest, it did not affect my relationship with water in the pool, but I still feel very, very sad whenever I am in a, a, the sea. Like I don't like being on ships. I don't like being on, on boats. Um, uh, not because I'm scared of the water, but I have so much respect for the water. I um, get scared. And whenever I go on vacation, it's like in the Mediterranean. It's where, where it happened. My country is also on the Mediterranean. Uh, as example, my, my boyfriend's Greek. So whenever I'm in Greece, it brings a lot of you know thoughts and a lot of um, trauma for me. And it's just, it does not affect my relationship with the water but it just makes me sad knowing that you know lots of people lost their life there and didn't know how to swim or um in the end the majority of refugees are minors and it's just it's really really heartbreaking um but no it did not really affect my relationship with water uh, i think it did the, the complete opposite uh, when i went back to the pool and uh, when i started training it was the only thing i had when i got to germany um so swimming did really open the door for me and brought me where I am today. Without swimming, I don't think I would have been any, I would have been probably doing something really impactful, but I don't want to be, I don't want to not be called a swimmer or, or, or an athlete. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for like my dad put it, pushing that side of us. And obviously my mom coming every day to training, watching us getting bored making food for us, coming and drying our hair. I think every swimmer can relate with that. Um, so, yeah, no, no, I really, really love being a swimmer and um, it did bring me closer to it. That, that's really great to hear. Um, and so, so cool that you could take positives from that experience. So then, so then you meet Sven and you start training yeah. in Germany compare his training to your dad's how, how did okay. how did they differ <laughs> I mean Sven is an amazing coach um but the complete opposite from my dad um first of all Sven sometimes gets you out of training to talk about your feelings or to talk about what's happening in your life and I'm like Sven what are you doing we have training what is this he's like sometimes you have to pause training to talk about what's happening in your life and I'm like no you don't go <laughs> to train and then <laughs> awesome. after training and after training you talk about things um he, he could never be angry at me um and I I I was like relying on that and that's not a good thing because I was used to my dad being angry all the time and like not daring to tell him anything so whenever I had excuse, I told Sven and I knew that I can go out of training. I think we all relate sometimes when, you, when we know that the coach is going to let us out, we're going to say something. Um, but yeah, I need a coach that is really, really tough. But I did have a really good relationship with Sven and I did um, I did improve with him as well because he had, he had a large group and all of them were younger than me. That was very hard for me. Uh, but I was away from the water for three months and that was challenging. Um, and in general, um, he was very different, but also in a good way. Uh, he paid attention a lot to the technique and um, it, it was a fun time, to be honest, training with him. So then um, after Rio, did you train with him in the lead up to Tokyo as well? Um, no, I trained with a Cuban, Cuban coach uh, that was in Germany as well. He did not speak any English word, so I had to speak German to him all the time. Uh, they forced me basically to speak German so I can learn it. Um, he was exactly like my dad. I told him, hey, I have stomach ache. He's like, it's okay, it'll be fine. Go to the pool. Go there. Go to, go to training. You'll be fine. Uh, so I really love training with him as well. Um, but at one point, it got... Um, too comfortable in Berlin for me if that makes sense like everyone wanted to protect me in the swimming club everyone was so so kind and I felt like um, I want to grow as a person on my own as well and that's when I decided to um, go to the Olympic Center in, in Hamburg and I mm. trained with uh, two German coaches as well that were training the national team um, and it was challenging because like the level where they were 
it was very different from the level where I was. The gym level as well, it was so different. It took me a whole year to get used to just uh, the physical intensity of, of, of the training. Um, but I did improve a lot. I liked training there. I liked it a lot. It was challenging. Um, and yeah, I trained, I trained there until, until the Olympics. It was supposed to be one year. I went one year before the Olympics and then I lived there for three years almost. So, um, you can tell that I enjoyed it. And obviously it's because of COVID I had to stay one year longer. And, um, my roommates in Germany, her name is Hannah Kishla. She qualified as fourth for the relay for Germany. And she's at USC now too. So that's fun. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, Wow, that's full circle, right? Yeah. Or I guess at least a half circle. Um, so training for the Olympics and then actually getting to go, can you compare your two Olympic experiences, which not a lot of people can say they went to two, yeah. but I'm guessing the first was, was pretty different than the second. Um, it was really, really different because the first one, mm-hmm. um, it, it was – it was new. It wasn't. I wasn't expected to be at any Olympic Games at that point. I was just recovering. I honestly wasn't physically ready, neither. Like you can tell. Um, and my body was still recovering. Like on the way, we slept on the ground sometimes. Sometimes in the park. Sometimes just like sitting down. I ate every, you know, junk food only because that's the only thing you can get on 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 the way. Um, and as an athlete, I wasn't prepared, but I think it was, it was the right time when I went there, I was 18 only. Um, I, I, it was just an amazing experience just to know how excited everyone was about the team and how much hope this team brought to the world. Um, and it changed my perception about what a refugee is, about the word refugees, refugee, about accepting that I am one and I should be proud of it and not just um be sad about what happened um and yeah I was not you can tell I think from my face at the Olympics I was not happy with my time at all um but in general um the two experiences were very very different because I was older I knew exactly what I wanted to do as example in Tokyo what time I wanted to do I was a training in in a in a very good way and um uh, of course, like the crowd, it was a huge difference, but I knew that there are millions watching also online. So um, the experience, to be honest, wasn't so far off, I, w- I would say. Both of them were very, very unique. And I, I think it's the Olympic Games. I don't, I don't think you can compare that. Like each and every, um, how to say that, Olympic Games is very, very different. And I, I think both were very unique with or without crowds but obviously we hope there'll be crowds in Paris um yeah but no both of them were very unique yeah uh, more recently you went to the world championships in Budapest yeah uh I, can you talk a little bit just about that again as you said Olympics are so unique and so different um so mm-hmm. having another year of training under your belt what goals did you have heading into Budapest and how did that pan out for you? Um, oh, by the way, one more thing that I can tell. So Rio is not comparable to anything because I watched the last race of Michael Phelps. And I think that tops everything. Like he swam in the same lane when we were warming up and I was like, okay, you know, that's it. And no story. Um, but yeah, no, um, speaking about world championships, to be honest, uh, I was more relaxed than than for the Olympics. I at the time, I was I was training, but I was also just trying to figure out what am I gonna do with life. Uh, I was trying to figure out um, am I gonna do professional swimming until Paris or not anymore. So I was training and I was having fun. There was no pressure. I was just going to the gym. I was like giving my best, and I I wasn't like specifically saying okay my goal is to be the next Olympic champion. I just, at that time, it was just, you know, I'm training hard. Whatever the time is, it's going to be the time. And um, I really wanted to enjoy this experience and not just put pressure like always. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you feel like you came out of that meet having succeeded in that goal? 
Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, um, every every athlete or every let's say swimmer um, dreams of a gold medal. But I kind of at this point I came to terms with you know not each and every one of us is gonna win an Olympic medal or is gonna win a, a gold medal. And what I did in my life was way bigger than that. Even if it's hard for me, like. If you ask me right now, do you want to win a gold medal? I'll definitely say yes. But um, sometimes you want some things in life and it doesn't go that way. But um, the effect and the impact that I'm making on the world, me and my sister with a story um, and me working with UNHCR, as example, going to the Olympics and having the story like everyone uh, realizing what's happening to refugees and um, changing the world in a very, very small way, but an effective one. Um, I'm okay with that, to be honest, and not with winning the gold. D so you mentioned Paris earlier. Are you still swimming competitively and training for your third Olympic uh, Games? That's a tricky question. So, um, yeah, I'm still swimming, but I'm still deciding. So uh, the thing is, I'm, as you mentioned earlier, I'm studying now at USC, and I'm studying film and TV production, and that's a... Uh, it's a heavy program. So uh, they told me if you were to do that, you probably can't swim the next year because it's you have sometimes to be uh, to be in class for five hours working on films and so on. Um, and until now, I didn't decide. But even if I want to swim, I don't think my goal is the Olympics anymore. Um, I'm just going to swim for fun. And um, I did get the German passport now. So if I qualify, I have to qualify for Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, wow. that's a tough one <laughs> that is a tough one yeah i feel like they have um some of the hardest qualification criteria they do. right yeah i mean they have now some of the best swimmers the the best swimmers in the world and in, in long distance and uh they have some really good swimmers um but yeah it's it's not about that it's just about um i've been to two olympic games who knows maybe i'll be there to take care of the Refugee Olympic team once again, but not as a swimmer. Um, yeah, for now, honestly, I'm just figuring out what am I doing with life. I'm enjoying the movie uh, and I'm just swimming, but not competitively. I'm not doing any competitions right now. Yeah. Uh, you, you also mentioned the UN, sorry, UNHCR, which yes. is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, you are a goodwill ambassador for them. Can you explain... Yes what that entails for you? Um, yeah, I've been working with uh, UNHCR since almost 2017. And um, my work with them is um, about bringing awareness about refugees all, all over the world. And um, sometimes I visit camps and I uh, meet the kids or I meet refugees and I listen to their stories and tell it to the world later on. Uh, just to understand what they need or what's happening in the camps. Um, I also spoke at high-level events such as World Economic Forum to bring awareness about what's happening with refugees. Right now, I am also launching my own foundation where I'm going to help refugees worldwide and um, the sides of education and sports. So I'm going to have a lot of swimming courses for refugees and hopefully I can support um, refugee athletes as well all over the world. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I've been doing five, since five years now. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Congrats! If if people want to get involved with this foundation, is it launched yet? Is it soon to be launched? How can they follow along? Um, for now, we are just working on uh, launching it just legally. The legal papers are a little bit tough with anything nonprofit. Uh, but yeah, soon I'll probably create a. Um, Instagram page where everyone can follow and see our projects and support when they will support. We definitely will need a lot of volunteers. So I'd be really happy if people started volunteering and working with me. Uh, so in the meantime, I'm just going to plug your personal Instagram page. It's at Yusra Mardini. You can follow her there. I'm sure you will post lots about the foundation once, yeah. once it goes live and launches. Um, we've been following <laughs> your page the past few days um to in, in preparation for this podcast do you know that you've you've gone up like fifty thousand <laughs> instagram followers in like the last five days um uh, it's more actually i had 350 now it's 500 
as of today, it's 500. So, um, yeah, that's 150. That's crazy. <laughs> it's 150. I mean, the, 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 the time where I had that, I think I had 100,000 also at Tokyo. And really? th- yeah, that was crazy. But I did not surpass the 500. And now today I did get 501. So that is exciting. <laughs> and today is a really special day because that's, I did the, I got the 500,000. And today I posted my first ever cover magazine. It was, it's really nice. And I'm talking to him as well. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah, you were, you were on the cover of Young Magazine. Yeah. Um, which it's a great cover. Again, go check out use for his Instagram. You're officially now at 502. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, so you're just, you're just blowing up. Uh, and again, you're at USC. You're in their yes. film and uh, TV production yes. program. Tell me about the program. What has that entailed so far? And what inspired, you know, out of out of everything you could do, why this? Yeah. Um, so first of all, it was one of my dreams to live in the U.S., especially California. Um, I think, you know, everyone knows why. Um, and in general, I visited the U.S. so many times and I felt like really it's, the land of like dreams come true I don't know why but I think it's the movies but <laughs> but I really really wanted to um to live here for a while and uh, basically my my team when I was in Germany most of them went to the U.S. that year um after after the after the Olympics and then my roommate was going to USC and I've been to USC before like in 2018 I was here to do a a commercial and then like I swam at the pool and I was like I was so happy about it like I was like oh my god the pool is amazing um and then I applied I was like you know what I have nothing to lose let's apply I applied uh for cinematic arts and I applied also for journalism and in the end it was between you know journalism and cinematic arts and I love storytelling and both these majors would have been amazing um but in the end I think I like the more um, creative way where I can be in front of the camera, behind of the camera. Um, I can direct, I can produce, you know, write, write the whole story. Um, Stunt double. Lights. So yeah, I, oh, God. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, in general, it's just really, really exciting. And as for now, I did not do anything with cinematic arts yet. My whole semester was just online doing GEs which is not the same, but I mean, my professors were amazing and they were very understanding, like, because I had to do it online because of the movie and the promotion. I had to travel a lot. So I couldn't be in any cinematic arts classes because sometimes there are three hours. You're learning with equipment. You're learning how to, you know, create a movie. So you have to be there in person. Um, But yeah, next semester is all about cinematic arts and I'm very excited. (laughs) That is exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you. What's Thanks. the coolest thing you've done for the movie so far? For the movie, the coolest thing. Oh God, there was so many really cool stuff that we did. Um, honestly, I, I think the coolest thing is like just how many people we spoke about the movie to. Like just the media and the power of media, just to realize the power of media. And um, every journalist is different and just like, to get questions, different questions. Uh, But one of the most exciting things is that two students from the GF Kennedy School interviewed me, Matthias, the the actor that plays Sven and Sally, and their questions, honestly, were the best questions I, I got until now. And they were very, very cool. I think it was their last year at school. And their teacher was there, there there as well. So it was it was very interesting. But in general, it's a tricky question because I'm scared that I forgot something. But um everything we did until the until now, like with the movie was amazing. Obviously, walking with the red carpets at like film festivals, everything was amazing. And it's just seeing all the cast together for the first time and us as well, it was really, really um heartwarming and you just felt like it's a it's a family there even though like we just met each other. So it was really amazing. Was your family able to be there at, at, at any of the premieres or the promotional things? Uh, no, because they had my dad, my dad and mom work. 
so they couldn't leave leave their work and there is unfortunately still some uh, so i have the german passport but my family still have the refugee document because they got later on to to germany mm -hmm. so it's a bit it takes a long time to get some visas and um they didn't know like with their jobs when to take a break and so on so they didn't but they did watch the movie and they they liked it a lot that's that's good to hear do you find it ironic that you finally got your german passport and now you're living in the u.s I know it is a bit ironic, but um, yes, I know that I'm gonna go back. To be honest, I don't think like I'm gonna live my whole life here. I think it's an amazing experience, uh, but I honestly miss the feeling of just going down and finding 500 cafes next to me, like and libraries and everything. I feel like Europe, in that perspective, is very close to like the Syrian style, but here, like you need a car to get to the closest you know, breakfast place. And I, honestly, it's not bad. Like if you want snow, you have snow in California. If you want beach, you have beach in California. If you just like want to stay home and see the sunshine, it's amazing. Like I, I really like living here, but I definitely need a car. I don't have a car yet. Um, but yeah, no, in general, I have no clue what the future is going to hold, but my family is in Germany and I am German now, half German, um, half Syrian. And I am always going to be thankful for, you know, being able to just enter Germany and be a German citizen now. I, I don't blame you. I think Europe's way cooler than the US. <laughs> I, I would move there if I could and I might, but um, fair enough. I, I think that was a great stopping point. I so appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat with us, Yusra. It, it was really cool getting to hear your perspective and your story um, about this five, seven year journey for you at this point. Um, do you have any parting thoughts for our audience before we sign off today? Um, no, I just want to say, please watch The Swimmers. Um, and I really, really hope that when everyone watches The Swimmer, um, you know, swims while most of you are swimmers, I hope you understand that um, it's not always about winning the gold. Enjoy the journey, uh, learn from your mistakes and um, you know, I was very, very close to giving up and that was the point where I decided not to. And here I am today. So um, for all the young swimmers, I really hope that they um, get to the goals they want to get to. And if not, it's an amazing journey. You learned a lot from swimming and try something else. <laughs>